morning, church, we're going to open up with prayer and then begin with our special theological enrichment program on black history. Father God, we thank you so much for bringing us here this morning, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunity to review the history of African Americans, Father. We thank you for that rich history, and we thank you for the opportunity just to look back on the accomplishments of those that have come before us. We just ask that you would continue to be with us on this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today, in recognition of Black History Month, our theological enrichment study will be a special program on black history. The title of our black history program is We've Come This Far by Faith, Celebrating Black History. Our program today will focus on four major topics. First, we'll look at the importance of black history, followed by a look at the heroes of black church history. Then we'll take a historical look at Negro spirituals and the Jubilee Singers, and conclude with some reflections on the story of black Americans. Black History Month is an annual observance that takes place in the United States during the month of February. The origin of Black History Month started in 1926 when historian Carter G. Woodson, known as the father of black history, and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, announced that the second week of February would be Negro History Week. This week was chosen because it aligned with both the birthday of Abraham Lincoln on February 12th and Frederick Douglass on February 20th. Black History Month was first proposed by black educators and the black United Students at Kent State University in February 1969. The first celebration of Black History Month took place at Kent State one year later from January 2nd to February 28th, 1970. Six years later, Black History Month was being celebrated across the country in educational institutions, centers of black culture, and community centers, both great and small. When President Gerald Ford recognized Black History Month in 1976 during the celebration of the United States Bicentennial, he urged Americans to seize the opportunity to honor the two often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. On February 21st, 2016, a 106-year-old Washington, D.C. resident and school volunteer, Virginia McLaurin, visited the White House as part of Black History Month. When asked by President Obama why she was there, McLaurin said, a black president, a black wife, and I'm here to celebrate black history. That's what I'm here for. Let's take a look at this joyous moment from 2016. Virginia McLaurin. Hi! Hi. 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 How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, so nice to see you. Oh, it's so honest, so honest. You want to say hi, Michelle? Yes! Yeah. Hold on, man. I don't know if I'm going to say hi. She's 106. No, you are not. You are so not 106. You gotta, you slow down. She Oh my goodness! I, I want to be like you. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> she dancing? Come on! Oh so what's what's the secret to, 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 the middle, to still dancing at 106? Huh? Yep. So why is it important for us to study black history? Well, we've all heard the quote that those who do not study their history are doomed to repeat it. But it is also important for us to celebrate the role that blacks have played in the creation of America. 
and understand that the past opens the door to the future, not only for this generation, but for generations to come. Celebrating black history also makes the history of African Americans accessible to the everyday person, regardless of race or color. As Christians, we must strive to ensure that people understand the African American story as a great act of deliverance and God's ability to bless the faith and perseverance of an oppressed people. This ultimately provides us with the opportunity to lead others to Christ, because the deliverance from sin and death is the most important thing for each and every one of God's children. Now let's take a moment to listen to others as they share the importance of Black History Month and what it means to them. Black History Month means to me a chance to reflect and a chance to think ahead. Black History Month is one of the best months. To look back on all the beautiful things we've done over the years. To reflect. On the people whose shoulders of which we stand. To look back and to understand. Foundations that people before us laid. The history of the contribution of African Americans to this country. Definitely at its root, Black History Month is a reminder. To really be proud of something that we were once taught to be ashamed of. Black History Month shines a light on all the progress that has been made throughout this country. Civil rights segregation, Jim Crow. Black History Month is a time to acknowledge all the pioneers that have come before. Rosa Parks, Langston Hughes, Malcolm X, Carter G. Woodson, Martin Luther King Jr., James Baldwin, Frederick Douglass, Maya Angelou. The importance of black history is all about all the things that make us unique. It's our month to truly convey how doing this is an effort to establish equality. So what does Black History Month mean to me? Honor. Culture. Opportunity. Achievement. Progress. Strength. Love. Respect. And possibility. Now we're going to look at the heroes of black church history. The profiles for two of these individuals are taken from the book, Beyond the Suffering, Embracing the Legacy of African American Soul Care by Dr. Robert Kellerman. And we'll start by discussing Lot Carey. Lot Carey was a Baptist minister and one of the first American settlers of Liberia. Born enslaved around 1780, Carey learned how to read the Bible and labored in Richmond tobacco warehouses before purchasing his own freedom in 1813. He brought land in Henrico County, married, and became a popular lay preacher. In 1815, Carey helped found the Richmond African Baptist Missionary Society, and after the establishment of the American Colonization Society a year later, prepared to immigrate with other free blacks to Liberia. He arrived there in 1821 and helped to settle what became the town of Monrovia in 1824. Demonstrating a wide range of leadership skills, he tended the sick, organized a native labor force, established a joint stock company, and helped extend the settlement's territory. He was twice elected vice agent of Liberia in 1826 and 1827, and president of Monrovia of the Monrovia Baptist Missionary Society. During the mid-1820s, such periodicals as the African, as the African Repository and Colonial Journal the American Baptist Magazine, and the Religious Intelligencer made Carey one of the most famous black men of his day. The Lot Carey Baptist Foreign Mission Society was founded in 1897 by African American Baptists who were committed to a substantial international missions thrust, especially on the African continent. They believed that nothing should distract the church from executing its primary objective of advancing God's mission throughout the world. The Lot Carey Global Christian Missional Community extends the Christian witness around the world. Through prayer partnership, financial support, and technical assistance, Lot Carey missionaries come alongside indigenous communities to support ministries of evangelism, compassion, empowerment, and advocacy. In the 21st century, the Lot Carey organization works with people from various ethnic identities, diverse Christian traditions, and different faith communities to help build a better world. Together, they are touching lives with transforming love. Lot Carey has left a legacy and is a phenomenal example of trusting God in the midst 
of impossible circumstances. Now let's take a look at another hero of the black church, Maria Stewart. Maria Stewart was a black abolitionist, feminist, author, and educator. To fully comprehend Stewart's staggering accomplishments, we have to backtrack to her less than advantageous upbringing. She was born in Hartford, Connecticut, orphaned by age five, and became an indentured servant, assisting a clergyman until she was 15. She attended Connecticut Sabbath schools and had access to the clergyman's library, teaching herself how to read and comprehend. Stewart became involved in some of the early institutions founded by the black community in which she resided, including the Massachusetts General Colored Association, which worked for the immediate abolition of slavery. Black abolitionist David Walker inspired Stewart, and six months after his death, she went through a religious conversion in which she became convinced that God was calling her to be a warrior for God and for freedom and for the cause of oppressed Africa. Married at 23, widowed at 26, converted to Christianity at 27, Maria Stewart challenges a nation at 28. Stewart connected with the work of abolitionist publisher William Lloyd Garrison when he advertised for writings by black women in his newspaper, The Liberator. In 1831, Garrison published Maria Stewart's first essay titled, Religion and the Pure Principles of Morality. Here, we have a young female African-American widow writing in a white male abolitionist tabloid as a spiritual director to motivate her people to learning and action based upon being created in the image of God. Using the biblical truth of the image of God, Maria Stewart guides her readers toward the countercultural but scriptural truth that it is not the color of the skin that makes the person, but it is the principles formed within the soul. Stewart inspires her audience to see who they are in Christ. She stated that, Many think because your skins are tinged with the sable hue that you are an inferior race of beings. But God does not consider you as such. He hath formed and fashioned you in his own glorious image and hath bestowed upon you reason and strong powers of intellect. He hath made you to have dominion over the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, and the fish of the sea, as we see in Genesis 1 and 26. He hath crowned you with glory and honor, hath made you but a little lower than the angels, as we see in Psalms 8 and 5. In 1831, no one was telling young black women that they were formed in the image of God. No one was telling young black women that they had God-given powers of reason and intellect. No one was telling young black women that they had dominion and honor. No one but God and no one but Maria Stewart. With everything stacked against her, and against her sisters of the spirit, Maria Stewart refuses to listen to the wicked ways of the world. Instead, she courageously chooses to listen to the edifying encouragement of God's word. She teaches us not to believe the world's lies about us, but to cling to God's truth about who we are in Christ. And now let's take a look at our final hero of the black church, Bishop Daniel Alexander Payne. He was an early leader in the African American Methodist Episcopal Church, AMEC, and served as the official historian. When Payne was in his 70s, he refused to stay on a train where he would have been seated in Jim Crow conditions. Standing his ground and confronting the white authorities on the train, he said to them, before I dishonor my manhood by going into that car, stop your train and put me off. After Payne left the train, the guilty conductor looked out and said, old man, you can get on the platform at the back of the car, to which Payne replied only with contemptuous silence. Payne then carried his own luggage, walking a great distance to his next speaking engagement in the Deep South. Payne literally walked the talk. He was the Rosa Parks of his day. In fact, Rosa Parks worshiped at an AME church. During youth Sunday school, she learned the history of the AME church, including the history of one Daniel Alexander Payne. Thus, we can trace the civil rights movement from Daniel Alexander Payne to Rosa Parks. How did such a Christian manhood uh, develop? 
Payne credits his father, who started him on his purposeful life. Payne says, I was the child of many prayers. My father dedicated me to the service of God before I was born, declaring that if the Lord would give him a son, that son should be consecrated to him and named after the prophet Daniel. Imagine the sense of self, the sense of biblical masculinity that Payne's father passed on to his son. He did so not only by naming, but also by modeling. Of his father, Payne testifies, he was a faithful observer of family worship, and often his morning prayers and hymns aroused me, breaking my infant sleep and slumbers. And now let's take a look at the third segment of our program, the history of Negro spirituals and the Jubilee Singers. Spirituals are a genre of music originating in the United States and created by African Americans. Spirituals will, were built on Christian faith while also describing the hardships of slavery. During slavery and afterwards, workers were allowed to sing songs during their working time. These were referred to as field calls. Spirituals originated from field calls, which were the cries and hollers of the enslaved people working in cotton fields. These field calls were the precursor to the call and response of African American spirituals, gospel music, and ultimately the blues, jazz, R&B, and other forms of African American music in general. Escaped slaves on the Underground Railroad used spirituals in various ways. First, they had to walk at night using hand lights and moonlight. When needed, they walked or waded in the water so that dogs could not smell their tracks. They jumped into chariots, which were stations on the Underground Railroad where they could hide and ride away. The reference to chariots could mean any place where slaves had to go for being taken in. So Negro spirituals like Wade in the Water, the Gospel Train, and Swing Low, Sweet Chariot directly refer to the activities of the Underground Railroad. The book Slave Songs of the United States is a major collection of Negro spirituals and was published in 1867. In reference to this book, we're going to take a look at a video excerpt from PBS documentary titled History Detectives Slave Songbook, Tracing the Development of Negro Spirituals and Cultural Connections to Africa. Let's take a look. By 1860, there are roughly four million enslaved Africans in the United States. Forcibly transplanted to a new land, they've brought with them a rich African heritage, including songs. Adapted to reflect the experiences of life of hard labor on plantations, these slave work songs, laments, and shouts of protest evolve into a new musical form, the spiritual. The spiritual will in turn become the wellspring for generations of musicians who will create the blues, gospel, jazz, and the protest songs of the 1960s. Now Avery Clayton of Los Angeles, California, believes he may have discovered a vital link to this important music. I was just going through some boxes in my mother's collection and uh, came across this book and noticed the date and read the first paragraph. and and I knew that it was something special. Avery? Hey, Wes. How you doing? Good. Good, Good to see you. Come on in. Thank you. Sure. So this is our Black Hollywood hallway. Wow, you've really come a long way since last year. Last year, Gwendolyn Wright met with Avery to investigate an intriguing autograph book with ties to the Harlem Renaissance. That book was just one part of a huge collection of African-American artifacts Avery's mother, Mamie Clayton, accumulated over her lifetime. Now that the collection has moved into a new museum in Culver City, California, tens of thousands of artifacts are finding a home. So Avery, what do you got for me? Well, I have a book that I found, and, and it's a collection of African-American spirituals. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's take a look at this. Slave Songs of the United States Wow, published in 1867. Yeah, two years after the end of the Civil War. What do you know about the book? 
Well, very little. You know, there is something that caught my attention, and, and it's in the first paragraph. If you don't mind, I'd like to read it to you. Okay. The musical capacity of the Negro race has been recognized for so many years that it is hard to explain why no systematic effort has hitherto been made to collect and preserve their melodies. And it got me to thinking, could this be the first book of Negro spirituals published in the United States? And that would be a really interesting thing. Sounds like that that's your question, in fact. Well, that's one of my questions. And then I also want to know, you know, who were the people who collected this music? You know, what was their motivation? This is a really fascinating story, and okay. I'm ready to get going. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> You know, I've sold hundreds, if not thousands, of 19th century books, and this has a publication date of 1867. The binding, the printing style, everything is typical of the period. But what's unusual is that the title page lists no authors or editors. Let's see if I can find them. Oh yeah, there we are. William Francis Allen, Charles Picard Ware, Lucy McKim Garrison. The book is a collection of 136 songs with music and lyrics. You know, I recognize some of the songs that are here, like um, Roll Jordan Roll. Here's Michael Rowe, The Boat Ashore. Most are songs I've never heard before. Many express a hope for redemption in the life beyond. Bending knees a aching, body racked with pain. I wish I was a child of God. I'd get home by and by. The editors took great care to record the words in phonetic English, just as they heard them. But I'm not finding any information on the publisher. An online search shows that Avery's book has been reprinted many times and remains in print today. Oh look, here's one from 1960, 1929, 1962, 1992. A popular work but nothing to indicate if this was the first collection of spirituals. I'm at Howard University in Washington, D.C. to meet Dr. James Norris, professor of music and director of the Howard Choir. Words. Dr. Norris has long known about this book and says its songs are deeply personal. My granddad was a Baptist preacher. I heard them sung authentically all my life. And they're just right here in my heart. To the enslaved African, what did these songs mean? These songs were everything. He had to sing about his condition. Being sold, his family being separated, he had to sing to keep his plain mental bearing. He tells me that plantation owners often forced enslaved Africans to attend church to hear the message of Christianity a message that missionaries carefully tailored to justify slavery. But the enslaved men and women took this new language and created their own spirituals, songs that often contain coded meanings, bringing messages of hope and sometimes visions of escape. Roll Jordan, roll. Jordan was what, a river you had to cross. Okay, that could have been what? The Mississippi River, the Tennessee River, crossing into a better place. Old Satan was the slave master. Hell was being what sold further south. So in spite of the fact that the words were actually biblical, mm -hmm. their meanings were very personal. personal. Dr. Norris explains that even though the words were from Christianity, these songs have their roots in Africa, where music was infused into every aspect of life. In the Americas, the enslaved Africans were forced to adapt. They weren't allowed to use instruments they brought with them. They took them from them. So what, they improvised with what? Hand clapping on the side of the heart. Improvise. I look at them and I marvel over how we got through all of this, but how we got through it all by what? Singing. No more path come for me. No more, no more. And no more driver's lash for me. Many. It 
It was the enslaved Africans' work songs that gradually evolved into the blues and formed the backbone of virtually every American music form created in the 20th century, including jazz, rock and roll, and hip hop. So Dr. Norris, is this book the first book of slave songs? It is the first large collection, yes, of slave songs, because others were published individually, like three and four at a time. So that's great. It's a very important collection. So who were the individuals responsible for collecting this extraordinary music? I'm at California State University, Dominguez Hills, to meet Hansonia Caldwell, a music professor emeritus and the author of books on the African-American spiritual. She recognizes Avery's collection right away. Those of us who are involved in the field of spirituals know this book because it's the first. Now, these three people, who are they? Do you have any information about them? Well, yes, I have some information about them in the back here. So yes, this is William Francis Allen. He was a Harvard graduate and a student all over Europe, came back and eventually became a university professor. And who's this? This is Charles Picard Ware, who is the younger cousin of William Allen and also a Harvard graduate. Most of the songs that are in the book are from his collection. Really, okay. Mm -hmm. And then Lucy McKim Garrison. Lucy is from Philadelphia. She was a pianist and a violinist and a piano teacher. She's the only musician in the group. Dr. Caldwell tells me that Alan, Ware, and Garrison were all committed abolitionists who'd worked before and during the Civil War to destroy the institution of slavery. The people who are pro-slavery are espousing a philosophy that says that the people that are being held in enslavement are not human beings. So one of the things that abolitionists were doing was trying to document the cultural voice of the African as a way of affirming the humanity of the African. She explains that in the 1860s, most Americans' exposure to the music of enslaved Africans was through minstrel shows degrading parodies of slave life written by whites and performed by whites in blackface. They were determined to say that Africans were happy as slaves, which was a nonsensical statement, but that was how they were portrayed on the stage. Dr. Caldwell says that after emancipation, many freedmen wanted to leave the music of slavery far behind. The fact that Avery's book has preserved over 100 of these songs is incredibly significant. It would have been possible to actually lose all of these songs. So the fact that they are still with us is really incredible. And now we'll take a look at the Jubilee Singers. The Jubilee Singers were organized as a fundraising effort for Fisk University, the historical black college in Nashville, Tennessee. The first group was organized in 1871 to tour and raise funds for the college. When the university faced financial problems, Fisk treasurer and music director, George L. White, who was a white Northern missionary dedicated to music and proving African-Americans were the intellectual equals of whites, gathered a nine member student chorus consisting of four black men and five black women to go on tour to earn money for the university. Their early repertoire consisted mostly of traditional Negro spirituals. The Jubilee Singers' performances were a departure from the familiar black minstrel genre of white musicians performing in blackface. Audiences came to appreciate the singers' voices, and the group began to be praised. The Jubilee Singers are credited with the early popularization of the Negro spiritual tradition among white and northern audiences in the late 19th century. The Jubilee Singers continue to perform today as a touring ensemble of Fisk University students. Let's take a look at the story of the Jubilee Singers. I couldn't hear nobody pray, cross and judge on. Couldn't hear nobody pray, oh Lord. I couldn't hear. Nobody 
pray, oh, I couldn't hear nobody pray. I was way down yonder by myself. I couldn't hear In 1855, a Tennessee slave named Sarah Hannah Shepard discovered that her daughter, Ella, had been trained to spy on her by their white mistress. Tormented, despairing, Sarah set off to drown her little girl, then herself. But Providence intervened in the form of an old slave woman. Mother caught me in her arms and while rushing to the river to end it all, was overtaken by Aunt Viney who cried out, don't do it, honey. Don't you see the clouds of the Lord as they pass by? The Lord has got need of this child. My mother took courage and walked back to slavery to await God's own time. Ella Shepard. fulfill the prophecy in a way Sarah never imagined, through Sarah's own songs of sorrow and redemption. One day, Ella would perform them in palaces, cathedrals, and concert halls, with a choir of emancipated slaves, and build a great university out of the sacred songs of Jubilee. Ella Shepard's father purchased her out of bondage and fled with her to Ohio, where she learned to read and write and play the piano. At the end of the Civil War, she returned to Tennessee. Determined to become a teacher, she enrolled at a struggling school for freed blacks in Nashville, named Fisk University. Fisk was a university in name only, a freedman's school established in an abandoned army hospital barracks. Fisk was dedicated to training men and women like Ella to educate African Americans across the South. The school was run by the American Missionary Association, called the AMA. Fisk's treasurer was a zealous missionary from New York named George Leonard White, a Union veteran of Gettysburg and Chancellorsville. White's job was to keep Fisk afloat, but he had been a choir master and a band sergeant, and his true passion was music. Entranced by the beautiful voices of the young former slaves who studied at the school, he began to assemble the most gifted into a chorus. We were especially fond of music and gladly gave half of our noon hour and all our spare time to study under Mr. White. We made rapid progress. Ella Shepard. In Ella Shepard, George White recognized someone whose passion for music matched his own. White appointed Shepard assistant choir director making her, at age 18, the school's first black instructor. Together, White and Shepard rehearsed the student chorus in popular songs of the day and musical pageants like the cantata of Esther. But White was most entranced by the mysterious, moving songs that Ella Shepard and the students sang for themselves. They were called cabin songs, plantation melodies, spirituals, and jubilees, folk hymns composed by slaves for worship and solace. Coming for 
You start singing a song, and when you're singing it first, according to the slaves, you're just singing the words. But after a while, it, it's almost like therapy. It begins to uh, take the frown out of the face. The shoulders begin to, to come back to their natural position. What's happening is you're going through a, a cleansing process These people were not readers. They were not writers. They had to sing songs with a few words that they could learn once, carry on forever, that everybody could sing at the same time. So you're going to find uh, spirituals that'll say, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Just a few words which are going to be sung over and over. The Fisk Jubilee Singers were the lyrical voice of Black Reconstruction. They introduced the world to the sacred artistry of their enslaved ancestors, the songs known as the spirituals. Their home base was Fisk University, launched in 1866 as a school for African Americans in Nashville, Tennessee. By 1871, Fisk was facing a serious financial crisis, placing its future in doubt. The school's music teacher and university treasurer organized a student choir, then led them on tour, hoping to raise enough money to save Fisk. It was a bold gambit. The repertoire of the Fisk Jubilee singers struck a chord with the audiences most white concert patrons had only seen black people on stage in minstrel shows. The spirituals were the country's first real introduction to African-American music and black religious traditions. These are songs of overcoming. They were about healing, they were about love, they were about the black struggle they allow someone else to understand what it means to be in your world or in your shoes. The Fish Jubilee Singers brought a sense of dignity, purpose, and beauty, shared that tradition, and served as a reminder of the deep humanity of Black people. With the profits generated by the group's performances, Fisk was able to buy the land on which it sits today. Fisk is one of the many historically black colleges and universities established during Reconstruction that still thrive. The Fisk Jubilee Singers have received the National Medal of the Arts and have been inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. To this day, the school continues to celebrate the departure of the choir's first tour. The final segment of our Black History program features the stories of a few African Americans that you may not know. The first two stories of African Americans were profiled by the StoryCorps organization. StoryCorps' mission is to preserve and share humanity's stories in order to build connections between people and create a more just and compassionate world. StoryCorps endeavors to remind people of our shared humanity, to strengthen and build the connections between people, to teach the value of listening, and to weave into the fabric of our culture the understanding that everyone's story matters. At the same time, StoryCorps is creating an invaluable archive for future generations. Let's take a look at some of the African Americans that were profiled by StoryCorps. First, is Dion Diamond. Taken in the summer of 1960, one of the photos shown here displays a young man as he sits at a lunch counter in Arlington, Virginia. Two of his fellow protesters sit behind him and a group of white men surrounds them. A white child sticks a finger in the man's face. This man is a civil rights activist you probably haven't heard of. His name is Dion Diamond. Growing up in the 1950s and 1960s, 
Dion was a bit of a prankster and spent much of his youth trying to, as he put it, crash segregated society. Let's take a look at Dion's story. I was 15 years of age when I first started having my own private sit-ins. I guess I got tired of looking at signs that said whites only. So I would go into the five and dime store, sit at the whites only lunch counter, and whenever the police came, I skirted out of the back door. My family had no idea. The only way they found out was from the newspapers. You know, like a reporter calls home, do you know your son's in jail? And my parents became very proud of me but they wished it would have been somebody else's child. I've done some crazy things, but you take chances when you're young. I call it youthful exuberance. I can remember having a sit-in at the lunch counter in Arlington, Virginia, and word spread throughout the neighborhood, and that's when they started gathering around this child. I'd say he was about 12, 13 years old. He took his finger and pointed to me like, get out, you know you aren't wanted here. I can, um, could only hope that as he got older, some of his attitudes regarding equality and equal rights changed. The last time I was arrested in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I was their guest on more than one occasion. So the guards, the white guards, told these inmates, we got a troublemaker here, gang. If you give him a hard time, you may get time off of good behavior. I think that was the time I was most frightened except a couple of the guys in there, they knew somehow who I was. And they told the guys, don't mess with him. That was my salvation. Today, when people read my name, they may not know who I am, and most likely they won't. I have three grandkids. They aren't the least bit interested. But any time I pick up a historical publication, I feel as if a period or a combo in that book is my contribution. And now we'll look at a story of NASCAR driver Wendell Scott. Wendell Scott was the first African-American inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Wendell started driving professionally in 1952, toward the end of the Jim Crow era. His family members served as his racing team, and they traveled with him to the speedways across the country from their home in Danville, Virginia, as he became the first African-American to win races at NASCAR's elite major league level. Let's take a look at the story of Wendell Scott. He started racing in 1952, and, you know, it was like Picasso, like a great artist doing his work. And he was in that car, and he was doing his work. But, you know, he couldn't get the support where other drivers that we were competing against had major sponsorship. He did everything that he did out of his own pocket. And as children, we didn't have that leisure time. You know, we couldn't go to the playground. He said to us, I need you at the garage. I can remember him getting injured, and he'd just take axle grease and put it in the cut and keep working. But he wasn't allowed to race at certain speedways. He had death threats not to come to Atlanta. And they had to say, look, if I leave in a pine box, that's what I got to do, but I'm going to race. I can remember him racing in Jacksonville, and he beat them all. But they wouldn't drop the checkered flag. And then when they did drop the checkered flag, they had my father in third place. One of the main reasons that they gave was there was a white beauty queen, and they always kissed the driver. He finally got the money. But, uh, of course, the trophy was gone, the fans were gone, the beauty queens were gone. Did he ever consider not racing anymore? Never. That was one of my daddy's saying. When it's too tough, everybody else is just right for me. Like, I can remember one time when uh, we were racing the Atlanta 500, and um, he was sick. He needed an operation. And I said, Daddy, 
we don't have to race today. He whispered to me and said, lift my legs up and put me in the car. He drove 500 miles that day. He always felt like some days he's going to get his big break. But uh, for 20 years, nobody mentioned Wendell Scott. But he didn't let it drive him crazy. I think that's what made him so great. Uh, he chose to be a race car driver, and he was going to race until he couldn't race no more. Our final story features an African-American opera singer, Dr. Edmund Tolliver. Dr. Tolliver, who's the cousin of our choir director, Doug Tolliver, is an accomplished opera singer and has been performing in Europe for over 30 years. He was previously hailed as a most talented singer and performer in such notable newspapers as the International Herald Tribune Zurich and the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Born on Long Island, New York, Edmund Tolliver studied at Illinois Wesleyan University, earning a Bachelor of Music Education degree with honors. He received his Master of Music and Doctor of Musical of Arts degrees at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, where he sang in major roles in over 14 different operas. Dr. Tolliver began his full-time vocal career in Europe with the Vienna State Opera, singing there in over 135 performances. He has had major guest contracts at the Zurich Opera, Bavarian State Opera, Munich, Netherlands Opera, the Grand Theater of the Geneva Opera, and many more. We're now going to take a look at an interview that took place in the year 2000 with Dr. Edmund Tolliver, and we'll view one of his singing performances. In the studio heeft Klaus een gesprek met Dr. Edmund Tolliver over de opera Die Meisterzinger, waarin Tolliver een rol zingt. Introduce yourself, please. My name is Edmund Tolliver. My uh, usual, my calling name is Edmund Tolliver. My full name is Zalotus Edmund Tolliver. I'm originally from the United States. Uh, I've been in Europe now for the last 20 years singing opera here um, and uh, currently live in Germany and have been now in Holland actually for the last two years singing on a relatively regular basis here opera and I'm very happy to be here today with you. But why opera? I mean uh, you're black in American society it's belong more to the things like uh, hip-hop or uh, gasp, uh, something like uh, jazz, but opera, it is more really Spanish or very European, or, or, or you might European, say. European, I mean, yes. It is, this it is, but uh, <clears throat> you have to look at it this way, that uh, you know that also being a black person, that uh, the history of singing is very much a part of, of all black peoples. And in my family, it uh, in my family, very especially my family, um, all sing. In fact, I have my, my father as my, my, my greatest role model, um, who was a singer, and he just recently died, this past year, in fact. But uh, right till, right really up until the end of his life, he, singing was a very, very important part of his life. Uh, it was perhaps his influence which, which, uh, which showed me the way into, into music as such. My grand, both of my grandfathers were known singers, and all of whom respected uh, the the European music. You know the form of music that 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 is well, really stemming back to the time of the spiritual in the United States, when those were the old uh, the old um, folk songs, which were sung out on the fields. They were influenced by the Western influence, that is, the Western European music, particularly in their harmonies. This then grew then further, which then really worked itself into, the, into jazz, which is really pretty much an amalgamation, a combination 
of the of the types of music. And in fact, what the European music musicians were about, particularly toward the end of the 19th century, uh, was that they were trying to become as free, as free actually as what jazz did become uh, in the 20th century. So I see that as sort of like a relationship that classical music was trying to move toward this freedom which really ultimately has expressed itself in jazz. Why then and therefore cannot a black man sort of take part okay. in the uh -huh. in the uh, in the production of classical music as such? Okay, but so about my question, why yeah. jazz? Uh, well, uh, well, why, why, why why classical music? Uh, uh, yes. Well, uh, because because I grew up with it. Uh, we had a, a very very good music program in our school systems, particularly when there used to be enough money for school programs. It's not just a, a problem for for Europe here that uh, there is not enough music for the, uh, not enough money for the arts, uh, but also uh, we had, in my childhood, you know, there was a lot of money for that, and it was a part of the everyday curriculum. And I grew up playing the French horn, and I thought really for the longest time I would become a member of an orchestra oh, okay. before coming, a, even before thinking about singing as a professional career. Okay, but do you like also other kinds of music, or I mean music from uh, <coughs> black society. Like sure, Philippa. sure. Yeah. Well, you're, yeah. you're Brazilian and one of my favorite <laughs> music is, is Brazilian music. <laughs> oh. um, and uh, I'm a big fan of Ivan Lins and of course the Bossa Nova era and all of these, these things which came from Latin America, particularly starting in the 60s. Uh, jazz I'm a great fan of as well. I in fact sing spirituals. I sing a lot of the uh, more uh, the show tunes and jazz ballads myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not as facile to do, say, things like scat, which are those really fast-moving yeah. uh, uh, things, which a lot of jazz singers mm -hmm. do. But I try to think that it has not just it, not just the sound of an opera singer, by the way, when I do do this okay. music as well. So, okay. So you live here in Europe for um, uh, 20 years, sure? That's right. And so are you come here in Europe because of opera? Or I did actually the entirety of my studies in the United States. Um, at predominantly at two two universities at the first the Illinois Wesleyan University, where I did my uh, uh, my first studies in music education. That it was I became a teacher first, and but directly then on completion there I was accepted at the University of Michigan, and, uh, and then started my masters and then doctoral studies uh, as a performer. But um, can but you compare? Sorry, can you compare uh, the difference in, in opera in America in Europe? Is that a well? Hard the way? people ask me all the time because I've I've had a relatively successful successful career here, uh, in as much that if one doesn't want to call it successful, at least I'm still working. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been now a, a singer of opera for 28 years, and. Uh, uh, the biggest difference are the distances. I mean, Euro Europe is a lot more compact. Mm -hmm. For instance, okay. now I live in Dortmund, and that's about mm -hmm. two and a half ah. hours in, uh, away from here in Germany. And so, in fact, I was just I just returned this morning on, mm -hmm. uh, via train, although I was just there for a day. Uh, so I can see my family, and uh, so that makes it really very very nice. Um, it's oftentimes that it is a classical singer. And I have a great deal of respect for my colleagues that are mm -hmm. that whom I knew with with growing and who I've met over the years when I still go back to the United States, who get in their cars at the end of an August and come back in June. But that's mm -hmm. you know it's no it's nothing for family life. I okay. don't think. Okay, and so and so and what about your performance? Is more um, uh, between uh, Richard Fagnes, something like that. Well, uh, it, you mean in terms of the composers? Yeah, composed, yes. uh, It's mostly the heavier literature. I have a pretty heavy voice, um, and uh, and in fact, it's channeled itself. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we have our intentions to do more, um, but I do, I do do a, a great deal of Wagner, uh, which is quite a, kind of a phenomena in and of itself because it's considered to be the not just the, some of the heaviest uh -huh. opera around, but it's very has a very strong German uh, identity yeah, yeah, to yeah. it. Uh, in fact, my first opera, which yeah. I sang, was in was uh, a Wagner opera, was in Graz, yeah. Yeah. in Austria, and uh, and that is considered to be a place where it may not necessarily be welcome yeah. to see a black person yeah. doing this type yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's really. But
In conclusion, we should be proud of our black history and all that has been accomplished by people through the grace of God. Be sure to pass on this information to others you know that may not be aware of the rich history and accomplishments that we have collectively within our African-American communities. Thank you for participating in today's theological enrichment. We've come this far by faith, celebrating black history. We will now close with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the time that we've had this morning to reflect on the history of African-American people. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy over those years, and we thank you for the accomplishments of those that have come before us. Let it be a reminder to us that we serve a great and glorious God, and we can do all things, Lord, um, through you who strengthen us. Please allow us to go forward on this day, Lord, just praising and thanking you for all that you do and continue to do in our lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.